So I want to do a little bit of a talk about transliteration. I received a question about transliteration, so I want to kind of do a quick little overview about tra transliteration. Uh, because all of my focus tends to be toward ASL, um, I don't really have a lot of resources for transliteration, but I do want to take a few minutes here to discuss transliteration a little bit. So first of all, transliteration actually means taking one language and putting it into another form of the same language, okay? As with interpretation, that means taking one language and putting it into another language. Transliteration means taking one language and putting it into another form of the same language. So, uh, but it does not mean taking one language and giving it and putting it out word, giving somebody the exact word for word for word, okay? It says English to English, one language to the same language, all right? So very important distinction there. That's important to keep in mind because every single consumer we have has different needs. So you could have a consumer that requests that you give them um, word for word exactly what the person is saying. That's not our primary uh, consumer of transliteration services. That's the rarity, but it could happen, okay? Um, but most of the time, we are simply tasked with giving, um, provide, taking the message in English and putting it into a signed form of uh, of English. Uh, I do want to also state that there's something in our field called oral transliteration. Again, transliteration means putting one language into another form of the same language. And oral translation transliteration is uh, for somebody, for a deaf consumer who does not sign at all but reads lips. And um, so an oral transliterate transliterator goes into an assignment. Uh, and they provide the message by mouthing in a in a clear uh, way that they are trained to do. Oral transliterators are often used in business settings or in like group meetings where there's a deaf uh, person there that needs to be involved in this interaction, but there are too many people talking and overlapping on top of each other that the deaf person can't read lips uh, fast enough to keep up with the meeting. So they'll bring in somebody who is mouthing everybody's messages and the deaf person can just stay there and focus on this oral transliterator in order to participate in this meeting. Uh, some of the choices that they make are changing some words that are not clear on the mouth to other like synonyms of the words that um, that are clearer on the mouth. So they keep the message the same, but they make some choices with the words that they choose to mouth to make the message clearer for our consumer. Not only synonyms, but also rephrasing things. Like something like, um, suffice it to say, might become, so the point is, when oil, oral transliterating. I'm not an oral transliterator, but I just wanted to kind of make the parallel between the choices that they make and the choices that we signed transliterators should also make. Now, this is something to keep in mind because those same decisions that oral translator transliterators make, we also, when we are signing a transliteration, uh, can make those same choices to make the message more clear. Okay, so going back to our consumer, whenever we are interpreting or transliterating, ultimately our decisions must be made by the based on the consumer that we have because every single consumer or consumers, our hearing consumers need to be taken into consideration as well. They all have different needs. They all have different needs for a successful exchange of information, okay? So we always need to consider them. So let's just go through through some examples with three different consumers in mind. Let's think about one consumer who requires transliteration services. This person, you're more providing signed supported English. So they might be later uh, deafened, they might be um, they might speak, they, they speak for themselves for sure. Uh, they probably have no exposure to deaf culture 
or um, ASL at all, but they do know some signs that they've learned because their hearing has gone and they match some signs with English words. They also need very clear mouthing, um, but they have are, are completely flu fluent in ASL, I mean, completely fluent in English, and um, so they understand um, idioms and things like that that we use on a day-to-day -day basis in English, okay? So that is one of our consumers that we're going to be considering and making choices based on that. Uh, the next consumer we want to consider is a, a, a middle school student who has a cochlear implant. This student um, may or may may not be fluent in either language. So because of the way uh, they were exposed to language, they may be so-so with, um, with English, they may be so-so with ASL, and uh, their IEP in school requires that they are provided transliteration services. So you are there transliterating for this person, okay? And then the third consumer that you want to consider is a deaf adult that does that is not is not educated and um, may have not had access to language at an early age. And when they did, they were exposed more to English than they were to ASL. All right, so those are the three different consumers that we are looking at. Sign-supported English, um, late deaf and no exposure to ASL whatsoever, middle school student with a cochlear implant, and the uneducated deaf adult that only knows, um, uh, only is, has been exposed to English. Okay, so let's take a look at a sentence like, when I get home, I need to bake a cake. Okay, when I get home, I need to bake a cake. So even though the word get is in there, we wanna make choices that are conceptually accurate. This sign get, for example, means in ASL to receive something. It means to receive. And so when we're making decisions on the choices that we're going to make, we want to we have to think about our consumer. What, what the choices that we make like this, when, when we see this sign or when they see this sign, they immediately are thinking receive. And so you don't, you want all of our choices to be in line with the meaning and intention of the speaker. And signing something like this, immediately you think, the audience is thinking receive, and that does not match. And so a better choice of signs there is to sign when I arrive home, okay? When I arrive home. And in this case, uh, you may choose to even change the word that you mouth to arrive. You don't want anything to, to, to be misaligned. So when, when we choose, uh, when we mouth a different word, uh, um, especially if it's significantly different, then if we mouth a different word that we are signing, the audience goes, you know, what, we, you mouth this, but you signed this, what's going on? You know, they see the sign and they're trying to match what your mouth is doing um, with the sign and you don't want there to be a jarring disconnect, okay? So you can choose to mouth a different word that is said as long as the word still matches the meaning. So. When I arrive home, I need to bake a cake, okay? Very simple sentence. And that choice could be used for any one of those consumers that we just mentioned, all right? When I arrive, when I arrive home, I need to bake a cake, okay? Let's go to another example. Let's say, um, yeah, it doesn't matter where, where you're at. Let's say somebody says, wow, it's Monday and he's still not here? He sure is milking that vacation, okay? Wow, it's Monday and he's still not here? He sure is milking that vacation. So now we are tasked with this idiom, milking a vacation. So a couple of choices that we have to deal with that are one, we can finger spell that. Finger, there, transliteration requires more uh, finger spelling blanket. So no matter who our deaf consumer is, you will, if, if doing it right, you will be finger spelling more transliterating than you would uh, in ASL. And the reason for that is we are 
putting uh, spoken language into spoken English into signed English. And because of that, we are providing more of those direct English words. And the clearest, most effective way to provide those English words is by physically actually giving them the English word and fingerspelling it, okay? So with our first deaf consumer, the one who uh, speaks for themselves, grew up sp speaking English, is completely fluent in English, um, then you may choose to actually fingerspell that idiom, okay? He sure is milking their vacation. So you might say he really he's really milking that vacation okay uh, even with that first deaf consumer you may even add in an additional sign that matches the concept of this this idiom that you just spelled so you may choose to sign something like he sure is milking milking that vacation. So then I added a couple of signs that even further support this message that's being said. You may or may not choose to do that or be able to do that with the you know stresses that you are under at that moment, but that might be a good choice for consumer one. Consumer two, the middle school student who has a cochlear implant. If you are dealing with something like that, um, you may choose to just sign something like, he sure is extending and taking advantage of that vacation, okay? Or you may choose to fingerspell the idiom and give them that sign, okay? But just fingerspelling that word milking probably will not be sufficient in relaying that message because that word milking probably is not gonna be understood by the uh, and, and of course these are generalizations, but probably not gonna be understood by the um, the deaf student, middle school student with a cochlear implant, okay? They will probably not be familiar with that idiom, and so it'll go right past them and we've, we've then failed with you know conveying that message, okay? With the third person, the uneducated deaf adult, um, you would, there's, there's no reason at all to spell that word, uh, you just change the sentence to another English sentence that still conveys the message. You know, he really extended uh, his vacation, wow. Or he really is taking advantage of this vacation and extending it, wow, okay? So you would, changing it, you would change it to a sentence that matches the meaning and is still English. Of course, your choices have to still be in English because that is the language that our consumers know. So making choices that are that change the grammar to ASL, um, again, fails because if our consumer doesn't know ASL, then we can't give them ASL. Okay, a few other examples. There are times when you may just drop a phrase. So if somebody were to say something like, so suffice it to say, blah, 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 blah. Suffice it to say, blah, 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 right? Um, first of all, that phrase comes out so quickly, it just runs off our tongue. So the idea of, of possibly being able to fingerspell those four short words in the course of, say, a business meeting is very, very unlikely. So what we can do is, once again, cha re change that to the point, and in this case, the point of the message happens to be point, right? So the point is blah, 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 right? And so we're still giving them English. The point is blah, 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 blah. So instead of trying to think, trying to fingerspell, suffice it to say, you would just take that in, okay? Process it like we do when we're signing all the time, but especially when we're interpreting. Uh, take that in and change it into a uh, an, an English sentence that is is easier, shorter and clearer to convey. Um, okay, here's another example. Um, and this kind of incorporates ASL features. 
So even though we, we when we're transliterating, we want to provide an English sentence, grammatical English sentence, it is um, very good practice to still incorporate uh, a lot of ASL features. Those of you who have worked with me for a long time, uh, I often provide uh, inspiration videos of native ASL users, and you can see even in those ASL or those signers who tend a bit toward English, they still incorporate role shifting and use of space, and they reference their hand, and they use a lot of different uh, classifiers as well, a lot of different ASL features to make the message clear. So we wanted take that um that you know uh, model from these native signers and do the same thing with our own uh in interpreting so if you had a sentence like when i found out i got into college i was so excited when i found out i got into college i was so excited okay so um, the first thing, the first part of that is when I found out. So you could say, when I, when I found out, you could do that. When I found out, all right, um, or when I learned is the same kind of idea. When I found out or when I learned, um, we do want to keep, you want to err on the side of keeping the words that you hear when you're transliterating. And so it's probably a better choice in that sentence to sign found out rather than learned because either one of those will com convey the, the message just as easily. So, um, but then you could incorporate a, um, a visual. So you could say, when I found out, Okay, so I'm finding out on paper, right? And the next part of it, that I got into college. Now, it wouldn't be that I got into college and also consider when I college. Oh, sorry, that I college. Now, what I'm signing are the signs that I enter college. So when I found out that I enter college, that is not the same meaning as that I got into college, okay? Me entering college and that I got into college has a different meaning. Me finding out that I got into college actually means that the college accepted me, okay? So you don't want your sign choice to be different than the meaning. And so if you were to sign, when I found out that I entered college, when I found out that I entered college, that doesn't make any sense. So that is a situation where you really do need to change the English sentence to make it a clear representation of what the speaker is trying to say. So a better way to do that would be when I found out they accepted me or college accepted me, and then the last part of it, I was so excited and I was excited or I was so excited, okay? So those are the kinds of choices that you, that you are sort of tasked with when you are transliterating. Um, it's not, it, transliteration does not mean Every single word you hear, you have to sign. The only time uh, that you really need to represent every single word um, that you hear is when you have a deaf consumer tell you, I want every word. And then you have to do a lot more finger spelling to convey all of those words that you're hearing. That does not happen very often. And so you want to make these uh, decisions and choices um, to be able to represent the message in a clear way and not cause any misunderstandings. Um, I hope this helps the individual that um, asked me about transliteration, and I hope it helps anybody else who's watching this. Let me know if you have any questions. Bye-bye.